Hi, welcome to Keto Life Support, where we make your keto life sustainable, fun, and low stress. I'm Kim Howerton from theketonist.com, and I'll be coming to you weekly with some of my keto besties to bring you the practical, real-world keto advice that you need. Quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor, and even if we have a doctor in the house, he or she is not your doctor, and nothing on this show should be taken as medical advice. Always check with a trusted medical professional about your personal medical concerns. Hi, guys. Welcome. Ooh. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. I, I opened the door and for like 30 seconds was like, am I interrupting an actual church service? <laughs> <laughs> then I saw the shirts. I was like, okay, these are my people. So, hi, I'm Kim Howerton, and uh, I'm going to introduce everybody who you already know, but, you know, it's formalities. <laughs> this is Carrie Brown. Hi. This is Dr. Ken Berry. And this is Nisha Salisbury. And uh, we are the, what are we? We are the people who talk a lot on a new <laughs> podcast that's coming out soon, as soon as iTunes figures out why it isn't coming out right now. Um, but it's, it's, it's imminent, uh, called Keto Life Support. Um, and the idea behind this podcast was, you know, not everybody who goes keto has the kind of support that they need in their hometown. Uh, maybe their family isn't keto. Maybe their family actually thinks they're insane. Um, maybe their children are against them because they took away the Doritos. You know, it, it can be a kind of lonely thing to do when you're the pioneer, <clears throat> you're the first one of your kind in your life. And so we all have at this point been keto for many, many years and have the benefit of keto besties in our life that we can always talk to. And we realize not everybody has that. And so we are now your keto besties or the keto bestie of anybody that you know. <laughs> <laughs> or anybody that you know in your life that is like curious about keto but a little bit scared or unsure, just needs some backup. Dr. Barry, he's got your back. He's, that's right. Yep, that's right. And then we brought along the three loud women <laughs> as well. As we we have to be loud because he's louder. It's true. It's true. So we, that's why the ratio is this way. <laughs> um, anyway, so I just thought everybody could introduce themselves and give a little bit of information about what they like to talk about and what you'll probably be hearing from them about. I'm the host, so I'm, I'm always talking. <laughs> it's true. Um, but then we're going to rotate through with everybody else and, uh, and talk about different things. So, yeah, I'm Nisha. I'm uh, this one's wife. I'm also knocked up. And uh, <laughs> so my thing is I'm not real science-based. I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for almost 15 years. I've done all kinds of nursing, geriatric. I was actually, I worked out of prison for some time. It was really weird. Um, labor and delivery. So I've got a background in a pretty well-rounded area, but I don't talk about it in the same way that some of our medical, like Nurse Cindy really gets behind the science stuff, and I'm more of a just, I'm just a real person, and this is how I'm doing it on the daily, and of course, moving forward, I'll talk about keto and pregnancy, and keto with kids, and you know, baby led weaning, keto style, that kind of stuff, so that's, that's kind of going to be my niche genre. Niche's niche. Niche's niche. Yeah. <laughs> and I am Carrie Brown, and I am currently co-host the Two Keto Dudes podcast with Mr. Franklin. And um, my thing, if you don't know me, is I have two things. One is food. I'm a trained pastry chef, and I have authored five keto cookbooks. And I develop recipes specifically for keto, low carb. And so I like to talk about food. I like eating food a lot. And I like teaching people how to cook. And one of my missions is to prove to everybody that keto food can be every bit as fun and delicious as the whatever diet they have come from. So my aim is to translate the science into what you actually put on your plate and eat to get the results that you're after. And the other thing I do is um, I resolved my bipolar 2 disorder. So I talk a lot about mental health, 
probably not going to be my focus on this podcast. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about food. But um, I have resolved my bipolar, and that's another part of my mission, is to help everybody with mental health to have hope that they don't have to spend the rest of their lives with that, those conditions and to help them navigate how a keto diet can help with depression, bipolar, and, and all the other mental health issues. So that's me. Awesome. Oh, yeah. I have Hashimoto's, too. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll touch little. on that. We're all a little messed up. Yeah. But uh, uh, also, there's a lot of stigma attached to Hashimoto's and hypothyroid and how you need to carb up and carb cycle and et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that. And um, so I'd like to spread some light on or shed some light. Pregnancy brain. She spreads light as well. <laughs> 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 On uh, my experience with actually meat heavy slash carnivore and seeing um, a much better result doing it that way, even though I don't prefer carnivore, it, it gives me the results that I'm looking for. The reluctant carnivore. Yes. The reluctant carnivore. Yes. That'd be a good podcast name. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we just create podcast names. <laughs> And I'm Ken Berry, a uh, family physician, practice in Tennessee. I've been practicing for almost 20 years now, and I really enjoy talking about the care and feeding of the human animal. And that's what I like to talk about and study and discuss. And so I'll be talking about that, medicine, nutrition, health, uh, lifestyle, uh, if, if mental health. I'll get all up in your business if I need to, to help you sort things out. Awesome. Uh, and I'm Kim Howerton. I've been a life coach for 10 years. Uh, and then I realized I felt sort of like a fraud because I'd spent a long time saying, you can live your last, best life. And then I was like, I'm living my best life as long as you don't look at all of this over here. And uh, realized that I couldn't continue to be in failing health uh, ever increasing weight, ever increasing blood sugar levels, um, and what I called hedonism was actually food addiction. And I had to address those issues, and I did through keto. And so I talk about how to make changes. I also am a sort of home cook, a little less trained than Carrie Brown, but I make things work. And so I kind of talk about everything. Yep, so that's pretty much me. And so what we decided today because it is almost impossible for the four of us to be in a room without it becoming ridiculous. Um, in a good way, but you guys would be like, what is happening yeah. up there? Lots of squirrels. It's just tree. Anyway, yes. uh, but yeah. um, so we decided that Ken and I would do a Q&A. So we give you guys a chance to ask questions. We do a lot of Q&A on Facebook Lives and on podcasting, so kind of used to it. And we figured maybe you guys would like a chance to chat a bit. Um, and so we love Carrie Brown and we love Nisha Berry, but they are going to get a little rest. Yes. So. And also I want to mention, like, none of this is medical advice. Oh, good job. <laughs> and try to keep your questions pretty general, not too, like, personal, because that becomes a little bit yeah. of an in-depth thing. So we want everybody to benefit Absolutely. from your questions. So just keep that in mind. Thank you, Nisha. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> Nisha takes care of us. <laughs> Okay, go okay. so have fun. All right. Also, this mic is live, so come up to the mic. So this mic is, yeah, you're going to come to that one. I think there's, that's the only one. Oh. So if anybody wants to talk about anything, thank you guys. <laughs> We're going to give it one second because our audio guy's going to help us out. Oh, okay, well, Nisha... Stay close by. Nisha can answer a question from. Yeah. I don't know if it's live anymore, but we can see. Testing. Oh, yes. Yeah, it is. Okay. Are we on? Yep. I think we're. First questions for Nisha. I'm just curious if you don't mind sharing how you're eating with your pregnancy and if you're eating keto, does your OB have any problems with that? Good question. Uh, for the first trimester, I had lots of food aversions, especially to meat, which was pretty disappointing since I had started seeing so many benefits from being heavy meat, uh, almost basically carnivore. Uh, so in the first trimester, it wasn't cute. I was mostly low carb. I tried to stay as low carb as possible, but 
any woman in here who has been pregnant knows that you're kind of a victim of circumstance at that point and you just do what you can to survive. Once I got past 17 weeks, then I was able to eat meat again, which was great actually. <laughs> I ate my first steak while we were at the Redmond's Salt Caves and it was the best steak I've ever had in my life. So I was very happy about that. And ever since then, I've been able to stay mostly keto, carnivore. Every now and then I'll have a little treat. I love fat snacks. If you listen to us at all, you know that. So that's been my go-to sweet. But for the most part, yeah. And I have a midwife. Um, Go ahead. (laughs) They're Vanderbilt midwives. We live near Nashville, so... They're associated with Vanderbilt, and apparently they're very closely tied to Vanderbilt. And so I'm actually going to have to do the glucose tolerance test, which I'm very upset about. (laughs) Yeah, because we were really hoping to bypass that because uh, midwives are usually more holistic based and very open to alternatives and and i was going to wear the glucose monitor some of you may have seen that me and kim both well and ken too were wearing them and track my blood sugars and log what i had eaten and all of that stuff but um yeah they're gonna make me do it anyways unfortunately because the their rationale do you want to kind of explain their rationale because it didn't really make any sense to us superstition (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it really is about it because you do a glucose tolerance test at 28 weeks give or take right well what if a woman's are what if she what if she came to the pregnancy as a an undiagnosed type 2 diabetic she going to wait and let damage be done until 28 weeks and then diagnose the type 2 diabetes well actually yeah that's what they're going to do right uh and what if she developed gestational diabetes earlier than 28 weeks her and the baby will just suffer for two or three or four weeks until they do the glucose tolerance so first of all just the arbitrariness of that number is just ridiculous but then nisha was going to wear a continuous glucose monitor which checks her blood sugar every five minutes how is that not a hundred times better than checking two blood sugars at 28 weeks after she's drank, you know, a Coke, basically. That it, it just, it's just ludicrous. But the, the poor little midwife, she had the deer in the headlights look because we both pounced on her. And she was just like, no, that's... And she tried to say it's evidence-based. And we were both like, honey, yeah. honey, honey, yeah. come on. And then later we talked to another midwife there and she said, no, basically Vanderbilt has tied our hands. Obviously, you're a U.S. citizen. You don't have to do the, you know, you can do the CGM, but you can't deliver in the birth center with a midwife. You'll have to deliver in the hospital if you do that. And so Nisha wants the experience of completely natural childbirth, of the, you may perhaps a water birth, that sort of thing. And that option's off the table unless we do the glucose tolerance test. So, so we, we basically had to weigh, yeah. like, what do we want more? And so yeah. my birth experience was more important to me than skipping out on because it's like okay fine whatever i just i'll just suck it up and i'll I'll be very dramatic about it (laughs) (laughs) maybe you can throw up on her yeah i'm gonna be you know a bad you know i'm gonna make that experience not great for everybody involved because i'm having to suffer so you should also have to suffer but we're you know we just we it took us a few weeks to decide what we we're going to do yeah. we thought about switching providers and everything but we really wanted a birth center type birth where the midwife basically doesn't do anything but you know observe so that's why but is there any um validity i've heard this before that if you're keto and you need to take an oral glucose tolerance test that you should prepare for it for a few days by eating higher carb we've both heard that uh I'm not really sure how much actual science is behind that, and I think it's probably it, based on each individual and yeah. maybe how, how their sensitive they responds. are. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So um, we've had multiple women reach out to us on social media and say that they took it and passed it just right, fine. Right. And they were hardcore keto. And then we've had other people who said, "No, I, I was afraid I was going to fail it, so I carved up for a few days to kind of get my body used to that." And then I've also talked to a couple of women who ate a couple of strips of bacon before they went in. Right, and, and now I'm going to be doing that. Completely tempers the, the glucose spike, right? Because it doesn't have to be a fasting. protein and fat, yeah. yeah. And so unless they're going to directly observe her over the 24 hours before, she might fake the fasting. And she well, also might fake actually drinking the, glu- the glucose. They drink. said it didn't know, have to be fasting. We'll 
Yeah. yeah. No, somebody so, was like, bring a bottle with you and just spit it into the yeah. bottle. <laughs> We've had all these people yeah. tell us how to cheat the test. It's hilarious. Uh, yeah. It's so, like into the ficus. Right. But they don't have a problem with me eating keto. They don't. They haven't said anything about like, no, you should eat more carbs because your baby development or nothing like that. It's just the glucose tolerance test is where they decided to put yeah. their... Because Vanderbilt, down. that's mandatory to right. deliver in the birth center, which I guess Van, it is a subsidiary of Vanderbilt. It is. Yeah, right. you, they, you have to do that. So yeah. we'll compromise. We'll, we'll compromise in some way. We'll, mm-hmm. I don't know which way, but somehow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anyone else have anything they want to ask? Hi. Hi. My question is about fasting and autophagy. So if somebody has to take prescription medications and or supplements prescribed by some kind of a doctor, how does that affect autophagy when you're fasting? Are these meds that you that you will feel sick if you don't take food with or you could take them effectively without eating? Yes. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> a or B? Both. Okay. Okay. And do you take your medication once a day or twice a day or three times a day? Yes. Okay. All but day. but on a summer, daily basis, summer, which one? Summer once a day, summer twice a day, summer three times a day. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so I don't think the medication itself is going to break your fast if you take it with water. That's pro- that in no way is that going to meaningfully elevate your insulin level, right? Uh, obviously, if you take it with uh, a glass of orange juice, that's going to break your fast. Uh, but in, so if you're having to do that three times a day, then you can take it with water, and I don't think it's going to break your fast. But if, if you do have medications that, that you should or must take with food, then I would take those at the beginning of your feeding window, and just adjust your time schedule of medication intake so that it coincides with your, your feeding window. That's what I would do, yeah. This may be a silly question. Hopefully. If Misha's wearing a continuous glucose monitor, uh-huh. why can't you just two or three weeks ahead of time have her drink a Coke and see what actually We've happens. already done that, yeah. We've already done okay. that, yeah. So you know how she's she got borderline. She got she got up to about 140, and so it's still up in the air whether she'll pass or fail or not. Yeah, it came down very quickly. Yeah. Which again shows you the ludicrous test. It's already it peaks at 30 minutes, and it's already headed down, and so you could have a severely uncontrolled type two diabetic still pass that test and escape diagnosis. And it's just ridiculous, the, the kind of testing that we do in some cases like that. Uh, but, yeah, I heard it peaked at, what, 35 minutes, and it was already headed down at an hour. And that's when they check you is at an hour. And so we'll see. We'll, we'll update you guys on social media as it goes. It, we had fun in uh, – we were in Austin uh, last month, and we got these continuous glucose monitors. And I decided to have some fun with trying some foods out. And, boy, howdy, was that interesting – I didn't go out of what would be labeled in some fashion keto, but like we went out to dinner and I had like this enormous dinner of like tomato salad, which where I was like, wow, that's a lot of tomatoes, but a lot of tomatoes, this giant steak, I had coffee with cream afterwards. Uh, There was like charcuterie and my blood sugar went up 17 points, Um, which if anybody doesn't know, that's not bad. And uh, later, I was like, nothing I'm doing is moving this thing. It's like was watching paint dry. And I would have other things. It wouldn't move at all. And, um, and uh, so there were in my hotel mini bar, Smart Suites. Has anyone heard? Nisha was the first one to alert me to this, actually, because she did it first. Um, but we didn't have glucose monitors on then. She just tested her blood glucose. And it had moved her blood glucose very high. And smart sweets are a, a, a t- type of sweet. We'll bleep out the name on this podcast so we don't get sued. Um, and it's just a little baggie of like gummy bears or gummy fish or something. And it's made with, I think it says, soluble tapioca fiber or something like that on the back. And it's listed as a fiber. So if any of you count net carbs, the net carbs for this little bag were like three, according to the label. My blood sugar went up 50 points. 
just from this little teeny bag. And that was the most my blood sugar has gone up at any time I've tested it on keto. Yeah. And the, the fiber trick, that's why I just tell you guys, count total carbs. Because if you try to play the reindeer game of counting net carbs, manufacturers can use tab- tapioca fiber. They can use oat fiber. They can, what's the other one called? A prebiotic. Um, yeah. corn, soluble corn fiber F- corn fiber right uh, uh, resistant starch all these things and they'll they will affirm to you that it has no glucose response no insulin response but if you've got a CGM all the bullshit is out the window because in five minutes you can watch and see what your blood sugar does and I think that's why anybody who's pre-diabetic you used to be a type 2 you still are your type 1 you need a CGM in your arm because that's going to teach you more about what you should and shouldn't eat than any nutritionist, any dietitian, any endocrinologist, because you are uh, you are a little bit of a special snowflake. We all are, but we're pretty much the same. But we respond a little differently, and and the the smart sweets are marketed for for kids and young adults that you can eat this, and there's basically no metabolic repercussions. It's just two two net grams or three net grams of carbs, yeah. and you're like, boom! I'm gonna eat the whole bag. And Nisha's blood sugar's never been higher than an hour after. After she ate the bag of smart sweets and she she pricked her finger and she's like what what was it 150 142. 142 it's never been that high in her entire life and this is from a product that's advertising itself as low carb effectively and and won't spike your blood sugar and she got the highest blood sugar spike of her life from that product and that's why i don't play the net carb game because it it's going to disappoint you every time and you've actually calculated it if you're eating uh 20 grams of net carbs a day that means you're eating somewhere between 20 and 150 total grams of carbs a day just depending on the product that you choose to eat i i did a little experiment and picked out products to kind of only i did not eat them i i did it on you know like but i in a tracker to figure out how i could what seemed like a reasonable day of eating based on the net carbs and yeah you can get as high as like 120 150 yeah, of, to- of total carbs. And the, I'm working on a YouTube video about this right now. These resistant starches, the tapioca, the oat fiber, all that stuff is not a zero calorie carbohydrate. It's anywhere from two to three uh, calories per gram. And so definitely it's not okay to not count fiber if, you, if you're, if you're going to play any kind of game, then you can count fiber eat as a half gram of carbs. And that'll get you much closer to a, a more realistic total carb count because uh, they'll tell you that oh it's not broken down in your small intestine at all the the bacteria in your in your large intestine break this down not true at all when you start looking at the research there's multiple studies where they show that it, some percentage of it is absolutely broken down and absorbed in your small intestine as a carbohydrate so yeah yeah next question and we'll we'll do a lo- I think we'll do a, a show f- on net total carbs definitely, ten point two. So we'll do longer. Hi. Hi. My question is regarding um, the social and emotional aspect of eating disorders. Um, I've noticed that there's a lot of people who are myself I've lost over 100 pounds I reverse type 2 but the pattern of eating is still something of a struggle point for me and so just maybe some top tips of how to deal with that emotional piece tell me more what what is the precise struggle for you that really causes you a problem um, just the disordered eating behaviors going back to maybe first it starts as um, the keto products like you were just saying where like they uh, maybe I uh, binge, like an emotional thing comes mm-hmm. up, and so I'll binge on keto products, mm-hmm. and either it'll just spiral back to carbs from mm-hmm. there, yeah. or it'll just go too long where, you know, I mean, there's a lot of empty box of some bar or something mm-hmm. yeah. i'm i'm a binge i was a binge eater before keto and so for me going keto helped quite a bit which you probably have the experience about but there is a place like in the last couple of months my life's been kind of stressful and i also wrote a cookbook and when i was writing this it's keto cookbook 
it's a good cookbook, you should buy it. Um, but um, when I was writing it, you know, I, I had a really tight timeline, so I had to make a bunch of recipes every day. So I was making like five to 10 recipes every day. And you know what happens when you make a recipe? You try it, you try it. And I was, I gained 10 pounds, just a little bite at a time. And I was like, wow, this intermittent fasting thing, that is not a lie. You know, you do need to give yourself that space. Just the frequency of meals can totally change how your body acts. On the emotional level for me, um, the thing that helped more than anything when I'm getting into that, because I will find myself starting on that spiral with products or baking, sweets, sweet things, carnivore. The best thing that I can do if I'm like, this is getting a little out of control, I don't like where this is at, I make a a rule for myself. I can eat as much meat as I want. Yep. So I will literally sit down with a pound and a half of steak, and I just will say, when I cannot put another bite of this steak in my mouth, I will stop eating it. Yep. And I do that for a few days, and my brain shifts. I don't put sweetener in my coffee during that time. I'll have coffee. I can have a little cream in my coffee, but otherwise I try and avoid dairy for the most part other than butter, but it's butter and steak or any kind of meat. I just happen to prefer beef. Um, Sometimes I'll add a little bacon, sometimes a little chicken. What do you think? No, I think that's a great strategy. And and I was going to ask, where did she go? Over there. Can you feel it coming? When you're about to mess up, can you do you know like oh I'm getting close I'm yeah so I would I would recommend that you it, and it, this is just a, a slight modification of Kim's strategy is to just attempt to binge on meat bacon ribeye I mean literally stuff yourself as full as you can get because first of all it's not going to be much of a binge because when you're full your your leptin and your ghrelin are going to say no nope, you're done that's it and so it's almost like you objectively you're able to retake control of the situation because you fed your hunger you fed your body the most nutritious food on the planet it is no longer hungry and then it's almost like you're you're mentally you just have to you come face to face with the addiction part and the disorder part and go no no, I'm full and I'm happy. And if I'm still, am I still hungry? I'll eat some more ribeye then. That's fine. And, but, but I have found that that fatty meat will turn off both the carbohydrate addiction, but also when you get to that, that binge, when you're about to go nuts, right? Don't reach for a keto product. Don't do that. Don't reach for any Don't product. Don't bake. Don't bake. Don't go to the grocery store for God's sake. <laughs> But you need you if and so if you're having a if you're in the midst of some drama or trauma and you know that's liable to happen, I'd keep two pounds of bacon f- fried in a Ziploc bag and I'd keep a ribeye already cooked and cut in slices, just so you've got you've also got that reaching. That's exactly you got it. The reach and get right, and so that you're you're satisfying this habit and the chew and the swallow. Exactly right. You can use both hands. It's fine. But then, first of all, you didn't just destroy your diet, right? And you also didn't just harm your metabolism by eating way too many either total or net grams of, of you know, carbohydrate or pseudocarbohydrate. But then also, I think it, I think it helps you face the, the, the super tentorial or the, the above the neck part of this, which is a big deal for some of us. But I think meat's the answer. I really do. And I'm, I, I, don't, I don't recommend that everybody be a carnivore all the time. But I think that it is... The, the ultimate food fatty meat is the ultimate food for human beings and so nothing dispels the for me the sugar cravings after a couple of months of of carnivore you could put the most delicious hot fudge cake in front of me that i and that used to be my jam just so you know and i'd be like i'm literally not even the tiniest bit tempted at all by that but even with with keto i would still be like "Mm, one bite won't hurt right but after carnivore, psh, I could care less about that. I just could care less about the carbs. Yeah. And so I think that's a brilliant strategy is just to stuff yourself with fatty meat as and then, quick as you can. Get it. Yeah. And I think having it pre-cooked is really helpful. And with you. If, if you're, you're in, you know, in a fragile position, yeah. have it in the Ziploc bag already ready. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then there then comes the hard part, right? Like I think those of us, I, not everyone who ends up heavy or with health problems 
is an emotional eater, but it they tend to go together. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and one of the reasons I really think that we become emotional eaters is it's a very easy coping mechanism. It often develops in a time in our life when we were underskilled in some way, yep. right? Where we didn't have the ability to say, I'm mad at you, or I don't like that, or, you know, to, to deal with things in a verbal way, or in an effective way in another. Some people exercise, and I'm like, those people are crazy, <laughs> yeah. you know, like to get rid of the stress. But but uh, it's also a socially acceptable way ex- yeah. to deal with, with psychic trauma or drama. You can, you can go and eat a whole cake, and people might laugh and joke about it, but they're not going to judge you like if you went and smoked crack, right? So it's, it's okay to eat a whole cake. It's like, wow, that's wild. You ate a lot of cake, but oh, whatever. But, you know, there are a lot of other ways that people cope with the psychic stress and trauma that are not socially okay. People will judge you for that. And so I think it's easier to just be a food addict in a way. Right, absolutely. Yeah. We are a food addict supportive culture. Yeah. Um, We are the methadone clinic of, yeah, 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 it's so, but it, and so once you take care of the more chemical aspect in terms of switching over to a meat based binge at that moment is you still have to figure out how you're going to deal with the emotional aspect. And if you want to take your Ziploc bag of bacon and hide in the bathroom when you eat it, you can. (laughs) It's okay. Absolutely. So, so looking for support taking walks, yoga classes, meditation, like ways that you're going to ha- help yourself just fortify yourself in addition is always very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Hi. Hi. Um, I just had a question about the continuous glucose model. Okay. And by the way, we've been asked to repeat the question because some people can't hear it. Ah, so. Okay. I'll be happy to answer it again. <laughs> I'll be happy to answer it again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So she asked, how do you get a continuous glucose monitor? And she's been searching high and low for a good keto bar, but she's afraid she might know the answer now. Yeah. So you have to have a, an order from your doctor, a prescription, to get a continuous glucose monitor in every state in the U.S., I don't know about other countries. I don't know. You about don't own in other countries. Some you other do countries not? Okay, you do not. Yeah. And so I think some countries, it's just like getting a glucometer. You can just get it from the pharmacy. But you cannot do that with a continuous glucose monitor. It's behind the counter. And so you have to have a doctor's order. Now, some doctors will balk at that, which is ridiculous. I mean, there's no point. And so they'll, and now sometimes your insurance will pay for a CGM. Sometimes they will not pay. And uh, I just called out a bunch of the big insurers on Twitter the other day. It's like, really? Do you not want to save life and limb? Because if you did, you'd pay for this. Because this is going to help save thousands of lives and thousands of legs and kidneys and eyes. Why would you not want to pay for that? But you're going to pay for some other silliness like Farziga, which never helped a single diabetic in the world, but you're not going to pay for a CGM, really? Uh, so you do need an order. And, but if your doctor balks, then they, they'll need a di- doctors have to have a diagnosis to write on the prescription before insurance will pay for it. And so if your blood sugar's even been one point high in your entire life, he can write down hyperglycemia. You had that when your blood sugar was high. That's the definition of hyperglycemia. And so that'll typically get it paid for. Metabolic syndrome will also pay for it. Uh, any any di- diabetes diagnosis, if your insurance is going to pay for it, that'll get it paid for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this if you have to pay cash, it's less than $250 for a, f- a freestyle Libre. Yeah, so there are two kinds that are commonly available in the United States, the Freestyle Libre and the Dexcom 6. The Dexcom 6 is actually a little more accurate, supposedly. There can be a little variation, but they tend to be both pretty good. But the Dexcom is a lot more expensive for most people. So most people end up getting the Freestyle Libre. If you have a fairly new phone, they actually just have a phone app. You just boop, and you can read it on your phone. And so it's really simple. It doesn't hurt. Um, they have to be replaced every two weeks, so things like that. But the first step is that you need to find a sympathetic doctor that will write your prescription, and you can tell him, like, don't worry, I'm not, you know, I'll pay for it myself, don't worry. Because they'll often want to, like, 
be like, well, you can't get it paid for, you know, so just tell them you're, you know, um, but you have to find a doctor that will write your prescription for one. <laughs> yeah, okay, sounds good. good. And then um, bars. Yeah, bars. So uh, the best keto bar that I have come upon is the sliced up ribeye strips that I told her about <laughs> earlier. That's my favorite keto bar. Yeah. They're, you know, bars, coming from somebody who cooks, bars are actually one of the harder foods in a way because for something to be shelf stable and to not have to be refrigerated, and it has to be full of things that I don't really want to put in my body, mm-hmm. including right. a lot of fibers. Yep. And it, fi- it just upsets my stomach even on a short-term basis. And so, quite honestly, there are a few things like Peterson's, uh, is a meat company, and they make bacon in a little baggie that you can take with you. It is not enough bacon, though. It's a tiny it's, amount. It of is bacon. a very small amount of bacon, but yeah. bacon is cured, so bacon will last the day in a baggie in your purse. Yeah. So you can pre-cook some bacon, keep it in the freezer, grab some bacon, take it with you. Um, but you know, there are a few bars I've had that I don't think are awful, but it's like I don't know if I want to make not awful food choices anymore. I would actually like to make good food choices. So I'm like, oh, I would put these in my basement for a tornado, but we don't have those in California, so I don't need to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But now, if, if you're a, a, a hiker, a backpacker, extreme sports, you're out in the, in the bush for a week at a time, then you may need something like the, the keto brick or, or um, the, the keto chow mix that you mix up or something like that. And I, don't, I think they're, they are much less bad than the crap that's made by, you know, Carnation and Kellogg's and Kraft and Post. But on a daily basis, and the way you worded your question made me think that you're wanting something for kind of daily use. And you, you need real food for that. Because, and, and I have this theory, and I don't know if anybody's ever really looked into it or proven it false or true, but I don't think that you can scale up real food. You know what I mean by that? I don't think you could take a ribeye steak, and if I would just cook one, okay, here we got a ribeye. How can you make that shelf stable for a year? How can you do that? What must you do to that? Maybe you could freeze dry it. You'd have to, you could be, that's right. You could do it the old-fashioned way that we discovered thousands of years ago. That would be great, exactly. But in the in a modern way, so that you could put it in a, a foil wrapper and put it on a shelf at Walmart, and it sit there for a year and still be fine. I don't think that's possible. I don't think you can do that with real food. I think every step of the way, you're going to adulterate the real food, and you're going to make it less real food. It's going to become more of a food-like product the more shelf-stable you make it. And then how are we going to manufacture this so that you can turn out 50,000 bars an hour, which is what you'll have to do unless your bar is going to cost $12 a piece. You're going to have to mass produce it. How are you going to do that with real food and it remain real food? I don't think you can. Uh, And so currently my favorite keto bars are bacon in the Ziploc bag, boiled eggs, and ribeye cut in strips. And those are my keto bars. If I want to treat every now and then, I'll eat a, uh, a what is it? Uh, fat snacks? Fat snacks, yeah. They have great cookies. If you just want a damn cookie, it's fine. Just just make peace with yourself and eat that, and it's delicious. But on a daily basis, I wouldn't. I would, there's no keto product out there that I would use every day that is a processed food-like product. I don't think, I don't think they're good for you long term. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, sponsors. Uh, and, and and some of like like you mentioned some of the products out there like keto chow is a, a remarkable one like they're they're good products in that they're a good product but again a pro, a, a low product life is probably a, a good idea mm-hmm. yeah yeah next question first of all thank you for doing this it's awesome um, I would like you to speak please to those of us who may not have a thyroid anymore and the challenges and life hacks that we could do and that's with or without parathyroid compromisation. Okay. So the question was uh, how to navigate without a thyroid. Yeah. So all human beings, either with or without a thyroid, need iodine in order to not die, right? Iodine is a required essential element. So you need a good source of iodine. But then if you don't have a thyroid, you're going to have to take some kind of prescription replacement. And you want definitely, in my opinion, to take a desiccated natural thyroid 
uh, like Armor or Nature, WP, NP, and then in Canada, I think it's called IRFA. But they, it is not just fake T4, like Synthroid or Levothyroxine. It's real T1, T2, T3, and T4. It also has calcitonin in it. also has iodine in it. has all that stuff in it. And uh, they don't talk about that because doctors will tell you, oh, we, the human body doesn't need uh, T0 and T1 and T2. Well, that's stupid. God don't make stuff that there's, I mean, your thyroid wouldn't spend the metabolic energy to make it if it wasn't a thing, right? We just don't know yet what we need it for. And so the desiccated thyroid has the full uh, complement of thyroid things in it, whereas Synthroid and Levothyroxine are just fake T4. They don't have any T3 or T2 or T1 or T0 or calcitonin. And so you need all those things. And so you're going to have to take some sort of, of replacement from a, a prescription, and then also you need a good source of iodine. Other than that, that's pretty much, in my opinion, that's it. Then you just eat keto or carnivore and live your life and have fun, yeah. right? But but you got to find a doctor who will prescribe that kind of medication, but who is also knowledgeable in how to optimize that. Because many doctors, if your TSH, for example, is three or three and a half or four or five, They'll say that's normal, that you don't, you don't need any more. You're taking this little amount, that's all you need. And that's absolutely not the case whatsoever. Five years ago, it was normal to have a TSH of under 10. What? Yeah, that used to be, that's, that was the normal So your limit. body is like screaming. Right, exactly. But that was considered normal for a few years. And then they narrowed it down to five. And then now for most labs, it's down to three and a half. And if you don't have thyroid problems, you don't know what the hell I'm talking about right now. But if you have <laughs> thyroid problems, you know exactly what I'm saying. You can just imagine how you would feel with a TSH of 10. And your doctor say, no, that's normal. That's, that's perfect. And you're like, what? And so I think most women for sure feel best with a TSH of about one. And most men, uh, two and a half or lower. And so that's, that's where I try to keep my patients with a desiccated thyroid product. And uh, it, can, it can be quite complicated, but it can also be made quite simple. So, and, and Nisha is, has Hashi's. I have hypothy. So, I, you know, we, though I still have my thyroid, you know, experience a lot of the issues of trying to dial in an appropriate level of thyroid hormone. And, you know, it's, there's a, pretty wide number of especially women but people who have thyroid problems out there and get such bad advice and so that's definitely something we we discuss a lot because uh, for me I spent a good decade undiagnosed lost a lot of most of my hair uh, lost uh, you know just a lot of problems pretty much in a brain fog for a long time and so getting that medication dialed in. I also suffered from clinical depression from the time I was nine years old. Um, getting the thyroid dialed in and, and put on every antidepressant known to man, none of them did a thing until I dialed in my thyroid. Um, and because that can be, if you have people in your life who suffer from sort of depression that can't be managed, it's often a thyroid problem. And so for me, thyroid was the like the the key in the lock, but then keto ch- further elevated my ability to function in the world. And so, you know, I feel so angry sometimes when people will say, oh, if you have a thyroid problem, you can't do keto, which doesn't, I'm gonna, I was going to use a bad word, Dr. Ken. Um, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It is horse pocky. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it, it, but thyroid in a functioning body, is a very complex system. And so to your point, like that we would think just, you know, you can't use a hammer, you know, just, you can't just use a hammer to build your house. There are screws, there are things, you need this, you need that. And then that's what they're trying to do when they just give you, you know, one size fits all thyroid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next question. Stones and keto. Sure. Because we get some pressure to cut out the animal protein. It's a, I don't think that's what's doing it. Okay. So the question was kidney stones and keto, what gifts? Yeah. And so the, the, the primary principle that I like to apply to every single question is to first of all, let's talk about what, what, when, we, when we're saying keto and carnivore, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the proper human diet. 
This is a diet that our species has eaten for a quarter of a million years. And so Carl Sagan once said that if, if, if you come to me with an extraordinary claim, you better have some extraordinary evidence to back that claim up, right? And so what I'm promoting is the proper human diet. It's the diet that if you went back in time 50,000 years, our ancestors would say, yeah, I'll eat that with you, right? That's what they would eat, as much fatty meat as they could get their hands on, plus or minus some veg if they wanted or needed it. That's what we do on a daily basis. So first of all, just to, to insinuate that that diet somehow is going to increase your risk of kidney stones, gallstones, thyroid, anything is ludicrous, right? That's like saying, oh, if you feed a wolf too much uh, meat, he'll develop, I don't know, shingle toes, whatever. <laughs> What? That's what they eat. What are you talking about? They, if, if a wolf eats too much meat, that's ridiculous. And so with all that being said, no, I, I think I have a YouTube video about kidney stones and it makes no sense whatsoever. What leads to the kidney stones is par partially chronically elevated insulin levels and then the elevated inflammation levels in your body. And so as you continue to eat lower and lower carbohydrate keto, uh, you're going to make fewer and fewer kidney stones unless you have one of the very rare kinds of stones like uric acid stones or uh, like the staghorns that we talk about. Then you might, have a, you might have a genetic defect and you may have to wind up taking a specific medication like a diuretic or something else to kind of block that pathway if there's something wrong with your body. Uh, genetically. But if that's not the case, then the, the eating the proper human diet is not going to give you kidney stones. There is one exception, right? There's a pretty common oxalate issue that can happen. Right. That's right. And so in, in that case, then your proper human diet is, is an all meat diet. And it's not, it's never the protein that makes kidney stones. Never. It, protein doesn't harm your kidneys. It doesn't cause kidney stones. It doesn't do any of that. There's no, no research or evidence that shows that in any way. It may be the oxalates if you're eating too many vegetables. That may be part of what's leading to the kidney stones, but it's definitely not the protein or the meat. And oxalate talk. So if you have a problem with oxalates um, and you, so a lot of people switch on keto, they're like, they go crazy with like spinach and almonds and almond flour, everything. And, and those are very high oxalate foods. Yeah. And so uh, calcium oxalate, is that the kind of kidney stone that's high? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, calcium oxalate kidney stones are a fairly common issue. And so you've now raised a thing that will, your body doesn't respond to well, which may lead to that. You remove those. What can actually happen for a time is you have dumping of oxalates. And yep. so potentially you might have stopped the, the bad behavior. Right. I'm not a doctor, by the way, so Dr. Bear is going to interrupt <laughs> me if I'm wrong. But then, and that's exactly right. But then also you, uh, you have a history of kidney stones, so you probably know this, but many people in the room may not. Kidney stones only cause pain when they move. They can sit in your kidney dormant huge stones for years and you have no idea that you have one. And so if oxalates are your problem and you go on an oxalate free diet, then your body's going to start to absorb that stone that's already there. That's maybe been there for a decade and you won't know any of this is happening until the day the stone becomes small enough to get into the collecting tubules and then move into your ureter, and then suddenly you've got a kidney stone. And the average person who's not a doctor or who's not an unwoke doctor has no idea that that stone's probably been there for anywhere from two to 10 years. It just now is the right size to get into the collecting ducts, and now you have pain. And so actually correcting your diet can put you temporarily at risk of making Expressing. more stones but you're not actually making them you've had them for years and now that you're reabsorbing those stones because your body tries to reabsorb and get rid of anything it doesn't need then when the stone gets small enough all of a sudden you wake up at 2 a.m with a with a kidney stone and go to the er and all the stuff that goes with that and a, a dumb doctor will say well you got to stop this keto it's causing it caused this kidney stone actually no it was it was correcting the kidney stone issue but the stone got small enough that it could move and cause pain all right, next question. Well, then you. So, uh, good afternoon. Hello. The mother of a good friend of mine has Alzheimer's, and uh, she's in a memory unit, and they're giving her a terrible carb laden diet. Yeah. What are your thoughts on supplementing with exogenous ketones? How best would you recommend administering them? Yeah. Okay, so the question was 
um, with a, someone with Alzheimer's who's living on a ward where they aren't in charge of their diet, they're being fed a lot of horrible garbage, um, would you recommend supplementing with exogenous ketones? Yeah, 100%. That's one of the few... Uh, instances where I recommend the use of exogenous ketones. Uh, it's also a, would be a great place for uh, the keto chow shakes, which I don't talk about a lot because most of us in this room, we don't need shakes. We need food, right? But if you've got a, a grandmother in the nursing home uh, who is not going to eat keto and who, who will drink a shake, would you rather her have Insure or Glucerna, or would you rather her have a Keto Chow shake that you made with heavy cream and some MCT oil or some avocado oil? I, in my opinion, that I think that's a great first uh, level therapy for people with Alzheimer's and any of the dementias to feed their brain and to get some ketones in their, in their brain. I think that's an excellent strategy you're going to have to have a discussion with the personnel who run the, the care home, right? And say, stop, do not give our, my, my relative this stuff anymore. From now on, I want her to have this and that's what she's going to have. And I, and don't give her that other stuff. But the, uh, the exogenous ketones in that instance, I would be a proponent of those and I would just use them according to the, the package instructions. Yeah, and there are yeah. both esters and salts in terms of exogenous ketones. There's a little bit of evidence that the esters are a little better. better. Yeah. They're, they taste worse, and they're more expensive. So that's kind but of... But you could mix the, the exogenous ketones in oatmeal and orange juice and coffee. You can mix them in anything that they're about to consume, and you're going to be putting some fuel in there for their right. brain. Right. And I've actually had completely anecdotal reports, but reports from, from uh, family members who said, yeah, when I do that, he's much better. Yeah. And, and actually, I think he's going to be able to stay home now instead of going to the nursing home because he's so much more stable. Also, you can I increase. So exogenous ketones, the, the lifespan in your body is really short. So it's going to be like an hour, like one to three hours that they're going to be a little helped by it. So you can extend that with MCT oil. MCTs have a natural boosting effect. Um, and and the low, as low a carb as you can get, you know, right. to balance it out and extend it. Right. But for a demented relative, you, the last thing you want to do is have a fight with them about, no, don't eat that oatmeal. That's not going to help anybody. Just put some, some exogenous ketones in there or some MCT oil. Uh, Dr. Mary Newport would put coconut oil in her husband's uh, whatever, whatever he was eating, and that helped him to do better for a long yeah. time. Yeah. And so I think that's an absolutely viable use for exogenous ketones and, and other uh, MCT and, and the like. Great. We have to wrap up in like five minutes, so let's get these questions quick because they're just the two people that are standing. Hi. Hi. I am wondering if you would address um, like the keto mojo. Like that, testing glu ketones? Yes, as opposed to the continuous monitor because then you wouldn't okay. you know, have to get your prescription. Your so, so the question was about using a finger prick method of testing your glucose. Often for people that would be a little okay. obsessive. You know, okay. what, what would be too much? No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. So about testing with a finger prick method versus wearing the continuous glucose monitor. Um, I would say your life will dictate how many times. So there are two, there are, so if you, if you want to test your glucose, you need to access either your blood or your interstitial fluid, which is what the monitor does. Um, if you think you can do a finger prick test and Keto Mojo is a great brand. They do it with that one. You can test both your glucose and your ketones, which is interesting, you know? <clears throat> Um, now, I guess the question is, what is obsessive is when your, your family thinks you're insane and when your fingers start to get really crusty because you've made calluses from how many times you've stabbed yourself. Yeah. Um, so for me, the <clears throat> monitor was amazing. I was testing it like, I was like, beep, beep, like you can be, it was like 40 times a day. I would not prick my finger 40 times a day. Yeah. And I, the, just the, if, if you are pre-diabetic or type 1, type 2 diabetic, LADA, any of the diabetics, you need to know your blood sugar very, very often. And it's just it's effortless and painless to have a CGM in. Uh, do you need to know your ketone level that many times a day? Uh, maybe when you're starting out this way of eating, you want, you want that for feedback and, and reinforcement and you just want to know. I think that's fine. But I, I don't, I'm not a big proponent of... Uh, you have to check ketones or you're not 
eating a ketogenic way, way or you're not keto if you don't check your ketones. I don't think that's true at all. Uh, and, and I think slowly, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow, I think we need to start calling this the proper human diet. Because that makes all the testing, and you don't need to t test. You know, we need to go and trap all the wolves and test their ketones to see if they're in ketosis. No, they're eating meat. I promise they're fine. They're good. You don't have to test them. You don't have to test us either if you're eating the proper diet. And so a lot of people love the CGM. And if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, you need that so that you can pretty much figure out what is your proper human diet. And that's how you'll figure that out. Do you still use one, Carl? Yes. You got it on? Yeah. So Carl's got one right there. And so Carl, if he's like, I'm not sure if this uh, old charter and Diet Coke is going to raise my blood sugar or not, he can have it and then he can check and he can, and every five minutes it's going to check and tell him this is your blood sugar at that moment in time. And that's, uh, that's like a PhD level of education for, yeah. for diabetology. So it felt very different to me to have the CGM versus the check, but you can. So you, there are ways and there are videos and I'll put some videos up. We have a Facebook group that's called Keto Life Support. We'll put some videos up in there. It's new, if you don't know. And um, you can find it on Facebook. And if our faces aren't on it, it's not ours. Um, and uh, so, but I, but I did find a real difference in wearing a CGM. Okay, last question. Sorry, gentlemen. This is definitely more of a ladies' question. But could you address why um, after a, a certain amount of time on keto and dropping... Um, for pant sizes, why a non-eventful, never problematic 20-year-old um, C-section scar would suddenly be acting up and itchy and burning and just not a good situation. I asked my primary, he said, just exercise more. Okay, so she has a scar. Since she lost 40 pounds, it's starting to bother her, itchy, burning. And, so, uh, and so he thinks that exercising more will help the itchiness yes. of your scar. Yes. Uh, the scar is, you know, there's less, and yeah. then you exercise, that will that's, sort of stretch yeah. back out. That's and, dumb. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that makes no that's sense right. whatsoever. If you go back, is he going to tell you to take some sandpaper to it? You know, when he was in 40 pounds, it wasn't uncommon, he said. So. For it to be <laughs> itchy. It's a, yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. I don't I know what so, that, that's dumb. Asking. Yeah. It, is, there, is there friction where there wasn't friction? Like, because sometimes as we lose weight, the skin that used to stick out now falls down. Yeah, I think that is true. Yeah. I don't stick out as much, yes. Yeah, and it also is skin touching skin because that's very, very common. It, this is either inflammation or infection. This, there's, there's nothing else it can be. Okay. And so either there's an inflammation that you need to address. And I'm not saying you're, you're inflamed, you're eating an inflammatory diet. I'm saying you may just have some inflammation on the scar from uh, friction or from clothing touching it that didn't used to touch it just that way because you've lost the weight and now you're shaped differently right but also it's very common if there's any skin touching skin to have a little kind of smoldering yeast infection and that'll make it itchy and burny I mean that, that to, in my mind that's the yeast infection until proven otherwise yeah he said it definitely wasn't any of that yeah. It, it, by yeah. just looking at you. So he did, he did he did a scraping and looked at it under the microscope or no okay so just he's just really wise and just knew that it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay yeah so I I would probably get uh, an antifungal and put that on there for a few days. This is not medical advice. That's right. But it, it, over the counter antifungal and try that for a few days and I think that'll probably make it go away. And then some one percent hydrocortisone cream if there is some inflammation that'll take care of that. Yeah. And, and if it doesn't get better, maybe another doctor. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us on Keto Life Support. If you'd like more, you can join our friendly Facebook group, Keto Life Support. Can't find it? Go to ketolifesupport.com. If you ever want to suggest a topic for discussion, that would be the place to do it. We'd really, really appreciate it if you would go to your podcast app and subscribe because that's awesome. And what would be super awesome is if you'd be so kind as to write a review for us, though we would love it if that review was awesome. Just writing a review is all we ask. So have a fabulous Keto Week and we'll see you next time. <laughs>